the only way that we can accomplish the mission that God has given us to do is by and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So God intentionally gave us a job description he knew we were incapable of fulfilling. And this is why so many people, when they say yes to Jesus, they get overwhelmed because it's like, I couldn't do nothing before. Now you're putting all this on me. When the truth of the matter is, we have people that are saying, yes, that I want to be a part of this mission. I want to be a part of this plan, but they don't understand how it happens. And so they allow themselves to get overwhelmed. Have you ever got a new job and you got this new job description? You sat down at this desk with all these weird people and this new address and you didn't know what to do. You didn't know how you didn't know the culture. You didn't know how things function. You didn't know who was the boss, who were, who were under you, who was around you. You didn't know who your friends were, who your enemies were, who the who the office gossips were. You 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 didn't know nothing and so you you felt like you were just in absolute agony because you knew this is where you're supposed to be but you feel ill-prepared welcome to serving Jesus you know is that amazing everybody loves to respond to altar calls when the anointing is present everybody's hair is standing up on end the people are getting blessed left and everybody wants to respond but you got to understand that is an equipping for what's going to happen when you leave the altar. Who's got your Bibles? Let me see those. Hold them up high. Okay, electronic Bibles. Let me see those. Well done. Well done. Earl, I see you're a glutton for punishment. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. Is that Stephanie with you? What's up? Welcome. Good to have you as well. Tell me your name again. Kareem, as in Abdul Dabar, Abdul Dabar, yeah, Kareem, the shorter version. All right, I can remember that now. Kareem, good to have you back, bud. Good to have you back. Welcome. Turn with me, please, to Matthew twenty-eight. Church would be such a waste if it wasn't for the presence. It'd be just another activity. Just another activity. Tell me your names again. Have I met you before? Juan? Yeah, see, so changing it all up, trying to make me call confused and stuff, you know, disguise. So Juan... And Raphael. How'd you find out about us? Just Rosemary. I'll have to send her another girl. Well done. Glad you guys are here. You're you're part of banging? Really? Stand up. How many's ever heard of banging for Jesus? Come here, stand out here. Stand here. You gotta stick your hands out front. Father, we bless today these men from banging for Jesus. I celebrate today, Lord, their boldness, the witness, the desire to serve and obey you. I ask you today, Lord, to baptize them fresh and new. Oh, fresh and new today, Lord, in the fire of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you'd burn up all the dross, anything that's unlike you today. And, Lord, just exponentially do a, an incredible work in, for, and through them in the matchless name of Jesus. Light their way. Prepare their way. I thank you for provision along the way. Yeah, I hear that. There's provision on the way. You can't wait to get the provision before you start. 
the provision is on the way. So, God, I bless them today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Matthew 28. How many in this room, be careful how you answer, have given all to Jesus? Hold it up. You've given all to Jesus. Okay, that's most, but not all. I want you to hear that the mission that God has given us to do is absolutely impossible. It's ridiculously impossible. The only way that we can accomplish the mission that God has given us to do is by and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So God intentionally gave us a job description he knew we were incapable of fulfilling. And this is why so many people, when they say yes to Jesus, they get overwhelmed because it's like, I couldn't do nothing before. Now you're putting all this on me. When the truth of the matter is, we have people that are saying, yes, that I want to be a part of this mission. I want to be a part of this plan, but they don't understand how it happens. And so they allow themselves to get overwhelmed. How many ever got a new job and you got this new job description? You sat down at this desk with all these weird people and this new address and you didn't know what to do. You didn't know, how, you didn't know the culture. You didn't know how things functioned. You didn't know who was the boss, who were, who were under you, who was around you. You didn't know who your friends were, who your enemies were, who the, who the office gossips were. You, you didn't know nothing, and so you, you felt like you were just in absolute agony because you knew this is where you're supposed to be, but you feel ill-prepared. Yep. Welcome to serving Jesus. Yeah. What he has handed us is impossible, and he did it on purpose so that the only way it could be accomplished is in and through him. That's the only way. Where's Nick Potts? When we got all that stuff back from Austin and it was like a trailer, a truck, and then my truck on top of that and it was just all full and uh, we were unloading stuff. Now, I know I'm capable of lifting and moving more than I do. Because I'm not trying to do my capacity. I'm trying to do what's less than my capacity so that I don't break myself. <laughs> Y'all ain't catching that at all. And so Nick, he didn't care, boy. He just grabbed a big old stack. I mean, I'm, I'm taking a stack this big. He's taking a stack this big. And I said, hey, I, I know you can. I just don't know that you should. No, got it. Here he goes. And so I'm like, okay. I mean, I get it. The dude's strong, right? So I kept warning him, quit lifting with your back. Lift with your legs. Until, oh, gee, he's sneaking in the back. Now he's listening to me. <laughs> so till one day, it wasn't just chairs and tables and furniture. One day, it was a transmission. Could he do it? Yes, he could. Did he do it? Yes, he did. Did he pay for it? Yes, he did. Huh? Because the moment somebody tells you that's too much, you shouldn't do that. You better leave that alone. You better put that down. Something happens, especially us men, we go, what? Come on, man. Get out the way, you know? And I'm going to tell you what it is. It's pride. Pride don't ever want to say, I can't. Isn't it amazing? Faith is designed for things when people say, I can't. Faith arises, and through God, we can do what's impossible. Look at Samson. It was the gift and calling of God, the anointing upon his life, that caused him to be able to rip the gates off and run five miles up the mountain and leave them up there, then yell back at him, come and get him if you want him. 
Huh? Can you imagine how dangerous strength would be without wisdom? Let me say it again. Can you imagine how dangerous strength would be without wisdom? My wife decided she wanted to see what the Jeep looked like with the doors off. And when she decides she wants to see something, so I'm out disassembling the Jeep, and my next door neighbor says, what are you doing? I already got three doors off. I'm on the floor. Figure it out, man. And uh, so I'm taking the doors off. Why? Why? Because my wife decided she wanted to see what it looked like without the doors. And I said, you telling me your wife ain't never asked you for nothing stupid? <laughs> he goes, point taken. <laughs> but when I was taking these doors off, you look at the doors, they look like matchbox cars. You know what I'm saying? You just pff, go, right? And so I'm trying to take this door off and it ain't coming. So I checked YouTube, and I did it right, and it ain't coming. And I'm hoisting on this thing, and the Jeep is rocking. I'm like, what is going on? So watch this. I thought, I'm, gonna, I'm just going gonna, gonna to take it slow. So I stuck my knee underneath the door, and I just wiggled the door back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And what you know, it just do, 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 right off the top. If I had just tr kept trying to pull, it never would have come. I had the strength the whole time. And so when God says, I want you to do this, we go, oh, I'm going to get it done. And God, no, no, do it the way I'm telling you to do it. It won't hurt you if you do it the way I tell you to do it. Do you see what I'm saying? Because we have so many ministers and people want to be involved in ministry that absolutely, woo, launch, and crash and burn. Why? Because they were doing it in their own strength. Can you imagine how impossible the Great Commission sounded to the disciples who heard it for the first time? Can you imagine? Matthew 28, verse 9. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Stop right there. <laughs> what, what, what if the Lord just spoke right now and said, no excuses? Go into every city inside of Oklahoma and win it for Jesus. Every city in the borders of Oklahoma. Go do it. Now, we'd probably be going 30 minutes of, woohoo, it got good. Until minute 31 hit, we go, how are we going to do that? Huh? I'm serious. I mean, we're still stuck on how we invite people to church and how do I talk to somebody about Jesus and how do I pray for somebody, how do I lead them into sinner's prayer. And we're, we're, still, we're still dealing with some of this stuff. And, and then God comes in and says, take the whole state. Why do you think I got you in Oklahoma City, capital city of the whole state? Why do you think I got you here? Take the whole state. And we're just trying to take our waiter or waitress at the restaurant. You catch what I'm saying? So the disciples are hearing this for the first time. Go ye into all the world. Get all nations. And if anybody other than Jesus had said it, they'd have laughed them out of the place. But how are you going to laugh when God says it? I remember years ago I was in a Walmart parking lot. I can take you to the exact spot. I was 33 years old. How do I remember that? Because he asked me how old I was. And I said, I'm 33. He goes, yeah, that's just about right. I said, what are you talking about? He said, about time you start pastoring. I said, Pfft. I am not Nigel called. I'm going to tell you that right now. You come in, do what you're supposed to do, and you just get out. You see what I'm saying? Same way in, same way out. I don't need that nonsense trying to 
tell me what you think in your flesh I ought to be doing and blah, blah, blah. And then fast forward all these years to Austin. There's somebody who hardly even knows me gets a prophetic word and says the things you said you'd never do. That's what you're going to do. All of a sudden, that carried a lot more weight. Y'all ain't hearing nothing yet. When God says it, it's a, oh, oh, wow. When man says it, it's like, oh, that's cute. Yeah, move on. You see what I'm saying? So this is why I get real. I try not to be impatient, but sometimes I'd be real impatient. When people are just all run of the mill, I got to be involved in ministry. I got to be doing I'm great. Do it right now. Where do you work? While I'm working out at the post office, great. Pray over every letter that touches your hands. Pray over every mailbox after close. You want to be in ministry? Granted, minister. But that's not what most people mean. What most people mean when they say they want to minister is they want to get funded by the church. I'm sorry. I should have wasted that point on you because I know you all know better than that. That's okay. So, therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, the authority of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. These people were just ordinary like you and me. They were not intellectual giants. They were not people of great wealth and influence. How in the world are they going to make disciples of all nations? They literally had just failed utterly in their confrontation with evil. That literally just happened. Peter denied the Lord three times. Everyone had fled and abandoned Jesus when the going got rough. You know, isn't that amazing? Everybody loves to respond to altar calls when the anointing is present. Everybody's hair is standing up on end. And people are getting blessed left and right. Everybody wants to respond. But you've got to understand that is an equipping for what's going to happen when you leave the altar. What's happening is the Lord is putting a saddle on you knee and you and cinching that saddle up. Why? Because you about to get rode. This mission outside of God is impossible. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follows me cannot be my disciple. It took me quite a long time to understand what he was saying. When your love for your spouse, when your love for your own life, by comparison to your commitment to Jesus, looks like hate, then you're not really sold out to Jesus. Here's what we try to do. We're trying to do this recipe of life. A little money, cars, house. All this stuff, you know, mix it all up. Oh, yeah, I need a little Jesus. Throw a little Jesus in there. And we're trying to add him to our own recipe instead of him being the absolute source. You guys have seen, I don't need to mention names anymore, you've seen the rise and fall of many, 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 many ministers, some in very recent days. I'm going to say that's in part because the people of God have been willing to abdicate their role in ministry and hang it on the preacher. 
and it just simply wound up being more than what he could do. I'm not blaming it all on the people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying everybody has a function. Everybody has a purpose. Everybody has a part. I don't know how many times you guys will see me moving chairs and stuff, and I'll pick up three or four in one hand, three or four in the other, and, I'll, and then people go, oh, no, 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 come, come here. I got, I'll take these. Why? Because you saw, not that I couldn't, but that I was struggling to do it, Right? And so you decided you would participate and do what you could do. Right? It needs to be that way every day in every way. I was hanging with my son the other day. We were, it was hot outside. We were coming up May uh, from the north side, coming this way. We saw this guy pushing an SUV by himself up a hill. People just going around, going around, going around. And so I put my hazard lights on, and Nicholas goes, we're stopping, ain't we? <laughs> I said, yeah, we stop. And, and so parked it, put the hazards on. I didn't have to tell him what to do. We didn't ask the guy permission. We didn't even tell him we were there. We wanted to see how strong he thought he was. Like, whoa, look at this, glory, you know. <laughs> So we, we come up behind and started pushing. And he realized it got real light real fast. He looked back and said, oh, oh, thank you. Right? This goes back to the whole see a need, fill a need. But there comes a time when we have to understand that the responsibility is the same regardless of how many people are participating. The same things have to be accomplished whether two are doing it or 2,000 or 2 million. But even with many hands, the commission that Jesus gave is impossible without the Holy Spirit. So we just read in Luke 14, 26, and 27, anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So apparently there's some sort of cross carrying that goes on that's involved in being a disciple of Jesus. So maybe this disciple thing goes beyond a prayer. Ever think of that? Discipleship is just above and beyond the prayer. The prayer is just the beginning. How many times have I told you that there was, I mean, we did a bunch of marriages up here, right? And everybody, they, they came up and they said, I you know, I give myself to you, and I'll be faithful to you as long as you both live, blah, 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 back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The marriage would not have happened without the commitment, but the commitment is not the marriage. It's the life lived after the commitment that's the marriage. I made this comment the other day, and this is, this is my first revision. I wasn't sure where this is going to fit, but I'm going to do it right now. How many got married last year? Look at that. Look at that. Got married last year. You did not get married last year, Lanai. What are you doing raising your hand? She better got married to Jesus. That's what I'm saying. So we would consider if we went to a marriage ceremony with no vows that it wasn't a marriage, right? And yet, we like to come to Jesus and do all the taking and none of the giving and call it salvation. So I wrote some vows that we ought to be transparent enough with other people that when they're saying yes to Jesus, this is what it means. This is just the first revision, okay? I reserve the right to change, modify, improve, and embellish upon, okay? So, Lord Jesus, I recognize that you came to this earth through a virgin without sin. You taught and demonstrated how to live life. You gave your life as a ransom for me. You sent your Holy Spirit to guide me. You, never, you, you promised to never leave or forsake me. You promised to be my everything. You are the definition of love. 
You've forgiven me, encouraged me, healed me, delivered me, and set my feet on a solid rock. There is nothing that you could have done that you did not do to bring me to this point as well as giving me a hope and a future. So that's a recognition that Jesus, I recognize this is, this is what you've done and what you've said to and for me, okay? So today it is my joy and honor to reciprocate to you the following. I give you my life because you gave me yours. I give you my past because only you can make something beautiful out of it. I give you my now because I don't want to miss another moment without you. I give you my forever. There's no one else I trust with whatever comes. I decide today to live my life here forward for you and you alone. I will learn to do things the way you guide me to. I, I will give up divorce and flee from everything that gives you pause or that does not represent you well. I will learn to serve you in every area knowing that I can trust your ways, motives, and faithfulness. I surrender all of my earthly wealth, such as it is, to your capable hands. I receive all that you are and have for my life. From this moment forward, I will proudly and loudly proclaim my love, devotion, and undying commitment to you. I never want to be known as anything or anyone outside of being yours. Lead, guide, protect, stretch, discipline, and encourage me all the days of my life. I withhold nothing, and I surrender all to you and look forward to what we will accomplish together day by day. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I forever give my identity here forward to Christ, and from this moment forward, I will be known as Christian, Christian, meaning Christ first, for he is mine and I am his. So what God hath joined together, let no man separate. That's a little bit different than, Lord, please forgive me of all my sins and give me heaven. Hallelujah, amen, glory to God. <laughs> I'm personally convinced that it's far more challenging to get someone to be a disciple of Jesus than to get someone to say the sinner's prayer. I'm not saying that we should get people to say the sinner's prayer. I'm not nullifying, canceling that, or minimizing that. I'm simply saying I don't think it tells the full volume. I'm a little concerned that maybe the sinner's prayer that we've come to know and love has become more of a religious ritual than it has a spiritual reality. What we need is transformation, not regurgitation. So how do we make these disciples? They're Greek participles. One is baptizo, and the other one is didasco. So baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit you got to understand something about water baptism in their culture. In that culture, when they committed to that degree, it could mean rejection by their Jewish community, loss of their job, loss of inheritance, and even loss of family relationships. When, when they said yes to Jesus and they got baptized, that was a divorcing of everything that was unlike Jesus. It really cost them to be disciples. 
You want to know how we're making disciples today? We tell them it doesn't cost you anything. Jesus paid the debt, so you get it scot-free. So just come and sign up. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that a little too real for you? Huh? And then we get concerned why there's not enough people wanting to pray the prayer, wanting to say, wanting to say the, the sinner's prayer and, you know, make it right with Jesus. Because they're not making it right with Jesus. They're making it right with you to get them off their back about Jesus. Okay, I'm not saying to everybody that said the sinner's prayer didn't mean it. That's not what I meant. I got so much here. I was uh, watching reels the other day, and I found this one. Nicholas, you back there? I'm going to want you to mute the background music and play that video. Um, when I saw this, my gut wrenched because it is to this that you and I are called. So if you, how many of you ever had a sales job? So how many understands rejection? You hear what I'm saying? So if you are so sensitive that rejection hurts you deeply, don't get a sales job. I'm serious. You'd be happier as a janitor. And I mean that sincerely. And too many people struggle to follow Jesus because part of that discipleship is rejection by others. So I want you just to see, it's 60 seconds, but I want you to see what you're up against and the type of response that you're probably going to entertain when you say yes to Jesus. This is the world in which we live. This is the world to whom we're called. I don't know how many times I catch myself driving down the road and seeing somebody on the side of the street or at a restaurant sitting at another table or whatnot, and no matter how gruff or irritable or angry or, or whatever they may be, I, I find myself praying, God, save them. Save them. And inevitably, I have to question myself the moment I pray that prayer, what is my level of participation to see to it that that prayer is answered? Because if I'm not careful, I'll think that my job is done because I pray for some stranger I didn't know. Lord, get them saved. Get a hold of their heart. Change them. But we all know that God's methodology of doing that is through sent ones who will say something to them who will risk rejection, physical assault, being cussed, cursed, laughed at. And we're still incubating our own feelings because somebody took our parking place or our seat or it was too hot or too cold or the music was too soft or too loud because it's all about our creature comforts instead of our commission. When we feel like the job is too hard. How many's ever looked at your garage and said, I'm going to clean that, and I know I can do it? Just not today. Huh? Might be your garage, your closet, your bedroom, your den, your office. Doesn't matter what it is, your car. I'm going to clean it. Woo! 
It's going to be beautiful someday. <laughs> huh? You see what I'm saying? And, and so our, our walk with Jesus winds up being like that. I'm going to be the man of God he's called me to be someday. Because we have this false expectation of time. I'm going to be a multi-gazillionaire. Can't keep a job for more than three weeks. Huh? First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.23, Jesus says, The message of the cross is foolishness to the Gentiles and a stumbling block to the Jews. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We are always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may re be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. So we've been given an impossible mission and we've been given an irreplaceable method because everybody thinks that they're going to reinvent ministry. Everybody thinks they're going to reinvent ministry. Jesus made ministry, and you can't outdo what he built. You can institute it, you can deliver it, but you can't make it better. So God's given us his method in Acts 1.8. says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. If I told my son, we're going to Six Flags, his next question would be, when? If I said, son, we're going to get you a car, his next question would be, When? If I said, hey, we're going to go on vacation, when? So when he said, and you will receive power, the disciples were like, <laughs> when? When that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. In fact, he goes on to say, then you'll be my witnesses. You know what the inference is? If you'll be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and the Holy Spirit hasn't come upon you yet, that makes you not a witness now. And they've been living the last three and a half years doing everything they, they could in order to be that witness. Y'all ain't hear anything yet. So he's given us an, an irreplaceable method that we have to have the power of the Holy Spirit. No other method is ever going to accomplish this task. The more we rely on our own ingenuity and strategies, the less successful we'll wind up being. Sometimes what looks like significant results in the end are very, very limited. In 1977, Peter Wagner, how many's ever heard of Peter Wagner? How many's never heard of Peter Wagner? How many didn't vote? Get him, Jesus. 1977, Peter Wagner tracked the results of a Here's Life America campaign in six cities. In those six cities, there were 26,535 gospel presentations. 4,106 decisions for Jesus. 526 people came to a Bible study And out of all those 26,535 gospel presentations, 
there was only 125 new church members. You know what that tells me? Everybody wants the benefits. Nobody wants the work. So only 3% of the decisions for Jesus actually became members of a church. And I can just hear people now, but you people don't need to go to church. Yes, they do. For the love of Pete. Yes, people do need to go to church. You can come up here, get married, leave the altar, and never go home. You can literally say that legally you're married. But in reality, it's a sham. That's what most people's relationship with Jesus is. They came to the altar, they made a commitment, they walked out the door, and they never looked back. So in 1976, in Seattle, a Billy Graham crusade had a little better results. 434,100 people attended the crusade. That's a lot of people. 18,000 decisions for Jesus. And 1,285 new members in the local church. So instead of 3% making it from salvation to the church in Billy Graham's crusade, 7%. Now the, this is not saying that these are powerhouses for Jesus. This is just saying they had enough commitment to get involved in the local church. But we see something completely different in the book of Acts. Here's something else I've learned about Peter Wagner. Peter Wagner had a friend. I can't remember his name right now, but I'm, I'm studying a little bit of his stuff. And I just want to ask this question. I'm just interjecting it here because I want it for my own information to know which direction I'm going to go. How many of you know for a fact, Jack, that in your family line, mother or father's side or both, you don't even know what I'm going to say yet, Laura. I'm messing with me. You know in your father or your mother's side, somewhere in your lineage, that you have Freemasonry in your family line. Hold it up. Hold it high. Hold it high. Some of y'all are acting like you Baptist all over again. Hold it high. I need to see. Okay. Thank you. So we see something very different in the book of Acts from what we saw from Peter Wagner's example or from Billy Graham's example. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter responded, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Notice the call to turning from sin. Notice the call for water baptism. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. I'm going to stop right here. In fact, I'm even marking this right now. Watch this. For all those that say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit are not for today, and it ceased with the apostles. I take you to Acts 2, verse 39. This promise, what promise? Of the Holy Spirit is for you, your children. Didn't, start, didn't stop with the apostles. He's already saying it's for you and for your children and for all who are way afar off whom the Lord our God will call. We are the far off from the apostles. It was for them who they were talking to, their offspring all the way down to us. So with many other words in verse 40, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So listen to the impact that it had on their lives. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. To what? The teaching, fellowship, bread, and prayer. What? Teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number. Who added? 
Who added? He added to their number. How often? Daily. Those who are being saved. So I need you to hear that the message of the gospel is confrontational. And the response is not just a commitment, but discipleship. We try to make the gospel anything but confrontational. If you remove confrontation from the gospel, you no longer have the gospel. In Acts 7, we see Stephen lays down his life for the testimony of Jesus. In Acts 9, Ananias risks his life to obey God and minister to Saul of Tarsus. In Acts 12, James gave his life for the gospel, and Peter is thrown in prison. In Acts 13, Paul has a power encounter with Elimaeus and, and, and leads the pro council to the Lord. At Philippi, in Acts 16, he had a power encounter with a slave girl who told fortunes. I mean, on and on and on and on this goes. There, this, this is full of people that are committed fully. Somehow these people in Acts got so radically saved, they gave everything to the mission. I'm not going to sit here and preach that everybody needs to give everything to the church. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is there's a stark difference in the gospel that's being preached today with all the sugar and filler than it was back then. Back then they were saying, you're going to have to leave your family, you're going to have to leave your job, you're going to have to leave, you have to leave it all because it's Jesus or nothing. Now we come to 2024 and what we're trying to tell people is keep all your stuff, just add Jesus to the mix. It's a different gospel today. That's why there's so few disciples. I'm skipping a lot. Impossible mission unchangeable method last point it's an irrevocable marriage irrevocable marriage we have to understand above everything else from acts 1 verse 8 it is the irrevocable union of the mission and the method so to try to accomplish the great commission in our own strength will always prove a failure I'm getting into some real delicate stuff right now because here's what I'm going to tell you. The moment I say what I'm about to go into, there will be people saying, I got the power of God. You can't tell me. This is not for that. If you carry the power of God and you do nothing with it, I won't be in your shoes if you stand before Jesus. So this isn't about whether or not you have it. This is about whether or not you're using it. There's a greater weight and a greater judgment for those that have it than those that don't. And there's, there's quite frankly, a false sense of security for those that like to be around it from time to time and think that because they're around it, they're okay. So let me wade into this gently. The power of God is not given as a form of Christian entertainment. The power of God is not given as a way of making you feel happier or lighter. Does it feel good for the Holy Spirit to come upon us? Yes. Yes. Yes, it does. But that's not the reason for which he comes. He comes to empower us for the mission. If we try to keep it for our own enjoyment, it dries up. It's like trying to hang on to manna. It turns to junk. Proverbs eleven twenty five. He who waters will also be watered himself. So the Holy Spirit, He's coming to empower us for service. So my question: Have you embraced not just salvation, but the mission that comes with salvation? Have you embraced that mission for your life? Is the kingdom of God truly the top priority in your life? Have you embraced His method? For winning people to Jesus, it's the power of the Holy Spirit.
I was thinking about this in the vehicle the other day. When I got here this morning, I wrote this down. I want you to listen to this, and then I'm going to pray for you. How many's ever bought uh, produce at the Whole Foods store or the organic whatever? How many's ever taken prescription drugs? Just to mess with you, how many's ever taken non prescription drugs? <laughs> I just know my audience, okay? <laughs> so, pharmacia, this is, this, is, this is just from my heart. I didn't pull this from it, just my story. Pharmacia is man made synthetic compounds fabricated to treat symptoms to bring relief that mimics wellness. But whole foods, meat, fruit, vegetables, herbs, they're full of God-created vitamins and minerals designed for our bodies to run efficiently, effectively, while simultaneously preventing organic sludge from adversely impacting life. You with me so far? So... What pharmacia did for medicine, replacing herbs, we now have fake food that takes the place of whole food. Fake food is created to look like whole food, but full of synthetic ingredients our bodies do not know how to process or use. It's designed to appeal to taste so we will indulge so that we eat for flavor instead of nutrition. God, help me right now. We're eating for flavor instead of nutrition. Just like people are coming for entertainment and not for presence. So fake food is designed for the short-sighted, watch this, cost-conscious. <laughs> Fake food is designed for the short-sighted, cost-conscious consumer. It provides temporary satisfaction with an addiction to take our wealth in small enough increments that it leaves the pockets of the unsuspecting with no worry or caution. It breaks the body down, causing them to turn to the doctors who prescribe more synthetics to mask symptoms to give the appearance of health while killing the patient. <laughs> you say, well, what's the point of you talking about Whole Foods? I'm so glad you asked. Because going to church... It's like going to the Whole Food store. I don't have enough time. My palate is not set for that stuff. It costs too much. It doesn't have the variety that I do at the department stores. So church winds up not being appetizing too expensive. It's not popular. You want popularity? Get a box of ding-dongs. You'll be popular real fast. Break out a bag of organic carrots and you will, be, you will act like you have the leprosy. There's too many less expensive options with what appears to be the same results. How many's ever got full on a bag of chips? How many ever got full on a bag of ding-dongs and Twinkies and Lucky Charms and Frosted Flakes, and right? So at the, it's when you got done eating, you go, wow, woo, I'm full for about 15 minutes. Right? You get some real food that your body knows how to process, that it knows how to use, and it starts pushing out all that sludge. 
we both appeared to be full, but only one got health. Both appeared to have the same end result, but it cost somebody more than it cost the other one. Because frosted flakes cost less than organic fruits and vegetables. One gives life and health. One serves death. Watch this. So church is not popular until there's no other options. Because when you're eating the fake food, not able to process fake synthetic materials, and you go to doctors who prescribe you synthetic drugs to try to give you a fake health feeling that brings you to an early grave, then all of a sudden we find out that we believe the lie, we've participated in the lie, we've consumed the lie, we've become the lie, and so now I better get to the church because there is no other option. And then we get disenchanted with God because, well, I gave you what you wanted. I finally came to church. I came to the altar and I bent my knee. You didn't get unhealthy overnight and you expect that somehow you're going to get healthy instantaneously. Even health takes time. <laughs> so Second Samuel 24, 24, and then I'm going to pray. Then the king said to Arana, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price, nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, that which costs me nothing. In this verse, King David is refusing to offer a burnt offering to the Lord that cost him nothing, and instead he buys the threshing floor and the oxen from this man for 50 shekels of silver. Why? He wanted it to hurt. I want you to hear that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not free. Salvation is not free. Salvation is where the Spirit is born again and we have the capacity to hear from the Lord. All things become new. This is for us. Salvation is for us. It is giving it all to God and learning from him, talking to him, hearing from him, and obeying him. That's what salvation is. Salvation is not saying a sinner's prayer and then living like we did before we ever said it. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is an empowerment for service. Can I tell you what really irritates me is when people talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the next step of increasing in the church body. It, it is, it's like your popularity grows when you get saved and then it grows again when you get the baptism and then it grows again when you grow up in eldership until finally you got a, you got a title and you got your elder so-and-so, your priest so-and-so, your bishop so-and-so, your what, it's all this so-and-so nonsense. The, none of us matter. The only so-and-so is Jesus. And so we have so watered down and so suppressed the real meaning of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we, we've been taught that it means that we get goosebumps and we can fall on the floor and we can jibber-jabber and call it God. And isn't it wonderful that these things can happen where God can come down like an old-fashioned jack-in-the-box and, and just flap our tongue around? Isn't it a wonderful thing? And it's so much more than that. We have relegated the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to some sort of a physical fix that makes us look important to our friends and loved ones. It's sad. It's sick. It's wrong. Don't tell me how much you can pray in tongues. Tell me what happened in your life because you did. Don't tell me how you're saying stuff you don't know what you're saying. Tell me what you're hearing from God that you heard because you said what you didn't know what you said. That's why so many people come to the altar to get filled. And they walk away disappointed because it didn't happen. Because if you're looking at it and the light that I just gave you, that's like handing power to somebody with no wisdom. If God's going to hand you all the power 
that he possesses to do the work that he called you to do. And you're going to walk around going, huh, blabbity, 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 look at me. D- d- haven't you missed the point? If the Lord doesn't change my mind Thursday, I'm going to give you a multiplicity of reasons as to why we should pray in tongues. And it's more than three or four or five or six. I'm just going to lay it out as plain as I possibly can. Because too many people coming down for goosebumps and falling out. And they're not leaving with a changed heart, a changed life, a changed mind, or a changed perspective. They're not functioning in power. They're not healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out devils, and speaking with new tongues. They're not doing anything different than what they did before they came for the blessing. You guys understand what I mean when I say don't throw good money after bad? God won't do that either. If you won't treat salvation for what it means and become a disciple of Jesus, why in the world is he going to hand a non-disciple all the power to change the world? God's looking for faithfulness. God's looking for sincerity. God's looking for sold-out mentality. God's looking for people that care far more about what he says and what anybody else at that restaurant says, Walmart says, gas pump says, on the street says, family says. You can never hold God's word in high enough esteem as long as you give a rat's rear end what anybody else thinks. Because the opinions of man will always pull you away from the things of God. That's why the things of God will separate you from the things of man. I remember having a conversation with my wife years ago. I've told some of you this before. Indulge me. I said, honey, should the Lord tarry, there's coming a day when you and I are going to be worm food. And our kids are going to be here without us. And while I want to be dependable and I want my kids to be able to count on me for protection, for provision, for getting them out of jams, for fixing all kinds of whatever, I'm, I'm in. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. But if I allow them to see me or her or both of us as their source, when we're gone, then who is their source? So I want them to learn the dependency on the Holy Spirit the way that we're having to learn the dependency on the Holy Spirit so that if I'm ever taken out of the equation, they don't fall off the track. They just skip over over my dead body and go straight on with Jesus because the one that led me will lead them. Do you see what I'm saying? So we have to have that type of mentality that I'm not coming up for goosebumps and blessing and just, you know, Whatever you want to give me, Lord. We, we have to understand that in order to receive the blessing, that comes with an attachment that says, this is for the express purpose of growing the kingdom, setting people free. You don't hand wads of money to people with no vision, with no purpose, with no job. Why? Because they'll find themselves a drug dealer, a video arcade, a department store, an electronic store. They will squander it all. Why? Because it was no cost. So God is looking for people who are making sacrifices for him already that have proven in salvation that they're willing to give it all up for Jesus so he can say, man, if you've been faithful with that, you'll be faithful with this. Here we go. Let's do this together. But he's not wanting to hand all this power to people that haven't even proven that they can walk right. Does that make sense? So this would be a brilliant moment to invite people to come up for prayer to receive the baptism. But I'm going to say, if you're really hungry for that, be here Thursday. Because I want you to know what you're getting. I want you to understand why you're getting it. I want you to understand its purpose. I want you to understand how it functions. 
I ripped flesh off my finger the other day trying to start that stupid weed eater. I mean, I kept blood, 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 and I was getting irritated. It wasn't hard, but I kept, blah, 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 and it wasn't working. I should have stopped and checked the manual or called somebody. You know what I mean? I, I should have done that. But I didn't because I understand the principle, so I kept doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it until I frustrated myself. So I got on YouTube, you know, the substitute for the Holy Spirit in people's lives. And I found the exact model that I had, and it says, I know this doesn't seem right, but pump the fuel bulb nine times. Then pull it once. Then turn the choke off, and you're going to have to pull it about another seven to nine times, and it'll kick it off. And I'm thinking, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. Well, I'm pumped two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Why? Because I was frustrated. Nine times, pulled it, nothing happened, put the choke off, pulled it, one, two, three, four, five, six, boom, 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 boom. What? By that time, I've already got skin hanging off, you know, and I'm bleeding and got to wrap it all up. And it, you know what I'm saying? Why? Because I didn't pay attention to the instructions. And this, this, is, this is our problem. We think that we understand the principles and how things are going to happen, but yet God is saying, here's what I want you to do. And I know it doesn't make sense to pump that bulb nine times. And I know it doesn't make sense that after you pump it nine times that you only pull the, the cord once. And I know it makes even less sense to turn the choke off at that point and then fire it up another five or six, seven times. But I'm just saying, do it because I said do it. Don't make sense why we got to have church on Sunday afternoons at 2 o'clock. Doesn't make sense why we're doing it on Thursday when nobody else has a church. We do it at 6.45 and not 7. Doesn't make sense why we're doing a lot of stuff that we're doing. But God says, just do it. I'm convinced that when this explodes, like I know in my spirit, it will explode. People will look back to try to find out the recipe, and it will be so all over the place, even they will have to admit that doesn't work. It had to be God. For those of you that caught us online today, I'm so glad that you did. For whatever length of time that you caught us, I'm grateful. If you happen to be in the greater Oklahoma City area and you're looking for a church home, we're looking to grow the family. We'd love to see you at 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m. Thursday evenings at 645 p.m. Uh, be sure to check out our, our church app. Uh, you can find that uh, that logo there, that uh, barcode, I think, on YouTube, Facebook page, so on and so forth. You can catch the calendar to see what's going on. We'd love to have you participate. So until our next appointed time, God bless you. Have an incredible day.